Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 11. We're going to continue on with our spore-forming gram-positive rods, including the Clostridium species. Welcome to Falcon Physician Review's online review for Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 11, where we'll be talking about Clostridium. The four important species you'll need to know in Clostridium include Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium tetani, Clostridium perfringens, and Clostridium difficile. Each has a specific disease with specific exotoxins that they produce. You'll need to be familiar with each. Let's start with Clostridium tetani. Clostridium tetani is a large, gram-positive, spore-forming rod which, found it, which is found in the soil. It's strictly anaerobic, and it produces tetanus toxin, which causes the, the problem that we need to worry about. On gram sand, it has a drumstick appearance. Transmission of Clostridium tetani depends on its ability to puncture through our skin. It lives in areas where there's low oxygen tension, usually in the soil, and through a puncture wound, it usually gains access to us. In some underdeveloped countries, neonatal tetanus also occurs. Pathogenesis of tetanus uh, is usually found where the infection remains localized, but the bacteria are able to elaborate the tetanus toxin, which is tetanospasmin, and that disseminates through the bloodstream systemically. It's usually carried intraaxonally to the CNS, where it blocks inhibitory neurotransmitters like glycine and GABA, which are released by inhibitory neurons. What happens then is you have excitatory neurons which are unopposed, and you get a spastic paralysis. Tetanus toxin is one of the most toxic substances known. The clinical features of tetanus include opisothenus and rhesus sardonicus, You'll have a figure here of opisothenus, which shows the muscles of the back and legs are rigid. This is a spastic paralysis, and the spasms, the muscular spasms, can break bones and be fatal through respiratory failure. Rhesus sardonicus is a sardonic smile where you have trismus and a facial grimace as shown in this figure. Treatment of tetanus involves hyperimmune human immune globulin, or TIG, to neutralize the toxin. Antibacterial agents include metronidazole or penicillin. You can also give spasmolytic drugs like diazepam. Wound debridement is important to eliminate the bacterial load. Delayed wound closure allows aerobic conditions which inhibit the anaerobic growth. And vaccination is a great way to prevent the disease from happening. We usually vaccinate our infants in the DTaP vaccine, the diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis. Tetanus is extremely uncommon in the United States because we vaccinate against it so thoroughly. Anti tetanus toxoid is antigenic, and we use the formalin inactivated form in our vaccinations. Clostridium botulinum is the next organism up. This is a large spore-forming rod. It's an anaerobic bacteria. It's found in the soil, dust, sediments, and decaying vegetation. It has seven toxicogenic gene types, the A, B, C1, D, E, F, and G. I don't know that it's particularly important that you remember the numbers, but you do, should remember the different gene types. Botulinum toxin is a neurotoxin that is a polypeptide. It's coded for by a prophage, which undergoes lysogenic conversion. You'll remember the phage comes in, does not cause lysis of the bacteria, and gets incorporated into the genome. It's heat labile, which is unlike Staphylococcus, and 60 degrees centigrade will inactivate the toxin. Botulinum toxin is absorbed through the gut, goes to the blood, finds the peripheral nerve synapse, and that's where it blocks acetylcholine release, causing a flaccid paralysis and respiratory failure. The clinical features to remember are three types of botulism. There's adult or foodborne botulism, there's infantile botulism, and there's wound botulism. Adult or foodborne botulism is an intoxication, uh, not an infection. It's rare, but often fatal, and we get access to the toxin in poorly preserved food. Most commonly you find it in canned alkaline vegetables like green beans or smoked fish. The signs and symptoms in indicate those of a flaccid paralysis. You have a descending muscular weakness, dizziness, dryness of the mouth, blurred vision or double vision. You can also get nausea and vomiting, inability to swallow, and difficulty in speech. There is respiratory paralysis within 18 to 36 hours after ingestion of the toxin. Infantile botulism is, botulism is the most common form we see, but it's still rare, and some people suspect it's a cause of sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS. What happens is the spores are ingested by the infant in honey, 
So usually children under two are not supposed to eat honey because of wound infantile botulism. Colonization occurs in the gut because there's no normal flora to compete. Then the toxin is elaborated from the gut. The signs and symptoms include constipation, limpness, dysphagia, weak feeding, and crying. Also, respiratory arrest is possible. These are all signs of a flaccid paralysis because of the toxin mechanism. Treatment for infantile botulism is supportive. You don't want to give antibiotics and you don't give antitoxin. The risk of death is greater from anaphylaxis from the horse serum than it is from the infantile botulism once it's diagnosed and supported. If the child is very sick, if the child's in the unit, you can give immune globulin. There's a, there's a botulism immune globulin, which is human immune globulin, which you can use. Wound botulism is the third type, and it's from traumatic implantation of spores that you get from the environment. It's an infection with in vivo production of toxin, and this needs treatment with antibiotics and with the antitoxin. Diagnosis depends on being able to find the toxin. It's detected by precipitation reactions or a mouse protection assay. There's an adult foodborne botulism test for food or for patient serum. There's an infantile botulism test for serum or stool. You can also look for electromyography because there's a specific pattern which demonstrates the flaccid paralysis. Wound botulism, you'll find the toxin in the serum. Treatment for adult or foodborne botulism includes antitoxin antibody, which is usually the horse serum, and respiratory support so they don't die. Infantile botulism, we want to do supportive treatment only, and again, unless they're very ill, we can give them uh, the immune globulin, the human immune globulin. For wound botulism, there's antibiotic therapy and also the antitoxin. Clostridium perfringens is our next bacteria. It's non-modal, it's anaerobic, it's a gram-positive spore-forming rod, and it causes gas grain green, which you'll find with crepitus. It also can cause food poisoning. It's found in the soil and also in our human colon. It's transmitted through contamination of our wounds. Clostridium, Clostridium perfringens has 13 tissue degradating enzymes that cause this list of problems. Massive hemolysis, thrombocytopenia, leukocytopenia, liver failure, blood vessel destruction, ischemic necrosis, and hydrogen gas produced by fermentation. This stops the influx of inflammatory cells it creates an anaerobic environment that allows rapid growth and spread of this strict anaerobe. Lab diagnosis includes detecting the production of alpha toxin, lecithinase, or phospholipase C. You'll detect this on egg yolk agar, and you can identify it by the enzyme inhibition with specific antiserum. What you'll get on culture is a double zone of beta hemolysis on blood agar, and that's unique. Diagnosis includes gram stain of tissues or exudates, and you'll get large gram positive bacilli usually won't see the spores because they're active and they're replicating. Anaerobic culture in milk media is important. You'll often get a stormy fermentation. The milk traps the gas and looks like storm clouds. Treatment for Clostridium perfringens includes debridement of wounds. You want to get the wounds open. You want to get the air in there because these are obligate anaerobes. You'll also give antibiotics such as penicillin, clindamycin, and if they're allergic to penicillin, you can give them metronidazole. Without treatment, this disease can be rapidly fatal. Within two days, people can die. Clostridium perfringens can also cause food poisoning, and this is due to an enterotoxin, which is produced by some of the strains of Clostridium perfringens. They can grow to large numbers in reheated foods. The enterotoxin is released as the bacteria sporulate in the GI tract, and there's an 18, 6, 8 to 16 hour incubation period. The enterotoxin is similar to that of the E. coli enterotoxin, it disrupts ion transport and causes watery diarrhea and cramps. You treat by supportive measures only. Often the toxin will be resolved within less than 24 hours, and you can prevent by proper sanitation, cooking, and refrigeration of your food. Clostridium difficile causes diarrhea and pseudomembranous colitis. It's often found in the setting of a post-antibiotic exposure, frequently with, frequently with clindamycin. Clostridium difficile is an opportunistic pathogen. It usually lives in our gut and doesn't cause problems unless its competition is taken care of. It produces two toxins. Toxin A, which is an enterotoxin, leads to mucosal damage, edema, pus, and diarrhea. Toxin B is cytopathic and it kills enter enterocytes. Treatment for C. diff colitis includes metronidazole or oral vancomycin. You also want to be important, it's also important to discontinue the offending antibiotic. This will allow the other flora to grow back and kind of suppress uh, C. difficile. 
Let's do some questions. Which of the following Clostridium species derives its exotoxin from a bacteriophage lysogenic conversion? This is something you're just going to need to know cold. We, we know that each of the Clostridium species has its own exotoxin, but we have to remember that Clostridium botulinum is a bacteriophage, and it's a lysogenic phage, and so the bacteria continue to live, and that's where it, it, it's able to elaborate its Botox. Next question. A mother brings her six-month-old infant to the ER because the baby is drooling and limp. She reports that the baby has become progressively weaker over the last two days. She denies any recent illnesses, trauma, or possible poison ingestion. On further questioning, she states the baby does eat honey regularly. Which of the following is the most appropriate course of action for the baby? So this clinical scenario is infant botulism. The child is less than two, month, two years old. The child has been eating honey and has been ingesting spores, which have elaborated the toxin, and caused a flaccid paralysis. We know that we don't give antibiotics for infant, botu infant botulism, and we know that we don't give the horse serum or the antitoxin therapy. And so the best thing we can do is supportive therapy, wait for the toxin to clear, wait for normal bacteria to come in and overgrow. If the baby is critically ill, you could give baby Ig. Next question. A 44-year-old year, year construction worker steps on a nail at the site, which punctures through his boot into his foot. He states that he has not received any vaccination since he was a child. Which of the following is the mo most appropriate therapy in this patient? And what you have here is a, a question which you'll often see on step one. It's the tetanus. Do you give the antibiotic therapy? Do you give the anti-tetanus immunoglobulin? Do you give the supportive therapy? If they're reasonably sure that they've had vaccinated, that they've been vaccinated recently, you don't have to give the anti-tetanus immune globulin. But if they haven't been vaccinated in a long time, or not since they were a child, or have never been vaccinated, you have to give the anti-tetanus immune globulin. Also, you'll want to give the tetanus toxin booster, or, or the vaccination itself. Antibiotic therapy doesn't really play a role, and supportive ther therapy isn't the only thing you'd want to do. So for this question, you want to give the anti-tetanus immunoglobulin and the tetanus toxoid booster. You'll actually want to give them in different arms of the body because if you give the immune globulin right after you give the booster, all the immunoglobulin will just bind to the vaccination you just gave them and make it null and void. Next question. A 56-year-old female recently completed a course of broad-spectrum antibiotics for pneumonia. She develops fever, abdominal cramping, and profuse diarrhea. Which of the following is the most appropriate therapy? Without looking at the answers, we know what they're talking about. We just had a broad-spectrum antibiotic. Now we've got the sudden onset of a profuse watery diarrhea. We're talking about C. difficile colitis, and she might have pseudomembranous colitis. We have to be able to treat the C. difficile. We'll want to stop the offending antibiotic, and we'll want to start her on metronidazole. Next question. Clostridium perfringens can cause all of the following except... So if we think about Clostridium perfringens, we think about the diseases it can cause, including gang gangrene and also gastroenteritis. So we know that we can get gastroenteritis, which is question C. Gangrene is a form of cellulitis. Also, if it goes deeper into the skin, deeper into the deeper tissues, it can be myonecrosis. We don't really talk about any pulmonary infections with Clostridium perfringens, so respiratory failure isn't something you'll think about. You do want to think about respiratory failure with Clostridium botulinum. That's a flaccid paralysis, and that's how people die from it, but not from Clostridium perfringens. That's it for Module 11, where we talked about the spore-forming gram-positive rod Clostridium. We talked about four medically important species of Clostridium, C. difficile, C. tetani, C. perfringens, and C. botulinum. You'll need to know that infant botulism is different than adult. You'll need to know about the botulism toxin. You'll need to know about the clinical scenario in which you'll see toxic megacolon from C. diff colitis. You'll also be familiar with what you do in terms of treating somebody with a wound for tetanus. Next up, we're going to go to Module 12, where we'll talk about the non-spore-forming gram-positive rods.